who will have the final keynote word on Saturday. In her 2007 IIBA Journal article, The Embodied Mind, Helen quotes Kathy Butler, quote, no longer is the skull a black box, its clockwork invisible, as it was to Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, and Helen adds in her italics, Reich and Lowen, and then the, and to the seminal thinkers and clinicians who have shaped the 20th century psychotherapy, that the skull was a black box to all of these people. Now, Helen and I mostly agree, but we also have a tantalizing way of not quite being on the same page sometimes. Uh, Helen continues, and I quote, as bioenergetic analysts, we talk about being body therapists, and we learn the various muscles and their functions. However, we leave off the head as if it is not part of the body. Now, to the extent that that's the end of the book, to the extent that Helen is accurate here, then our choosing our conference theme of integrating brain, mind, and body would indeed represent a full-fledged paradigm shift. But as I have said a few minutes ago, I myself have been teaching for many years and writing, etc., practicing the view that many of us choose a body-oriented therapy precisely because we live in our armored, associated heads, which we do not experience as part of our bodies. I call this condition, as was told to you uh, in the introduction, uh, I call it cephalic shock. And it is the somatic correlate of what Winnicott called the mind as the locus of the false self. Actually, a more current name for my construct integrating some of the late newer theory might be cephalic freeze immobility response. Um, while I have not yet tried the amygdala maneuver that Helen employs later in her same article, I have long worked to help my patients experience their heads as part of their flesh and blood living body and thereby reduce their driven mentation or compulsive thinking and perhaps even find some peace of mind. Neither Winnicott nor I, when, we, when I first described the clinical construct of cephalic shock in 1975, I think Winnicott died around 71, uh, had the benefit of MRI technology, and our clinical constructs clearly lack the specificity of the correlations of various functions with activity in specific areas of the brain. I was heartened to hear from her vignette. That's why one reason why I insisted that she do this, because I wrote her speech. It was a great vignette. Uh, that Margaret was moved to engage her patient's head as a crucial entry into a healing, rebirthing experience. And I do hope that well into our post-Lowinian uh, era, many bioenergetic analysts have been including the head as part of the body. Perhaps since 2007, when Helen was bemoaning the shape we were in, uh, even before showing up for this conference. Uh, section three, how does neurobiology help us? This is a very short section. <laughs> As I have said, we all need explicit and or implicit theories and models and interventions to help us in this impossible profession. Those of us who come to the healing profession with more than our, sh our own share of despair cannot afford to underestimate the importance of whatever sustains hope. The hope, I might add, that will then resonate in our patients. Those of us who as children were not attuned to not well read by our parents. I don't know if there's anyone here like that, but uh, <laughs> tend to carry a deep wound regarding the value of our deeper self. When we now try to offer in our therapist's role the empathy and compassion that we were not given, uh, Bob Hilton has written about 35 papers about this topic, but I'm just repeating it because I, I think it bears repeating. So when we try to uh, offer the empathy and compassion that we were not given, and our patient is difficult and does not respond appreciatively, 
our doubts about the real worth of the person we are are often just around the corner. How fortunate are we then that Alan Shore, for instance, teaches us that these amazing neuroimages demonstrate that our simple kindness and attunement are quietly brain-changing. Let me give you a personal example of the use or misuse of one of these models. I do not know how many of you are aware that I used to be a bad copy, both of Alexander Lowen and myself. <laughs> there are no good copies, by the way. <laughs> For the first five or ten years of my bioenergetic career, I kept myself and my patients busy. Uh, I filled my thoughts with character characterological schemas, and I interacted with the patients around bioenergetic techniques and uh, exercises so that I would not have to feel the fear, my fear, of the intimacy of being in the same room with another human being. In this sense, I used the classical bioenergetic model quite like a therapist would use self-touch, uh, for instance, to soothe himself and to regulate his arousal and feelings. In spite of this horrific description, I believe that some of my patients were well served both because of the inherent efficacy of the bioenergetic interventions and because my bioenergetic armamentarium provided me with a scaffolding from which I felt safe enough for something healing in me to come forth to my patients. And I think uh, that's kind of true of most of us, that we use whatever is our preferred intervention and mode and theory to become the best therapist we can for our patients. Um, as time went by, I myself found, felt that my bioenergetic approach was deeply validated by the attachment paradigm and by the work of mother-infant observers such as Carlin lyons Ruth in Boston and Beatrice Beeney in New York. First, I felt that the empiricism and inter-observer reliability of the attachment paradigm brought a solidity and respectability to the field of therapy that had been lacking. So even before neurobiology, so to speak, arrived on the scene, I was, I was feeling uh, prouder of our field at large than because of some of the empiricism uh, of that paradigm. They posited classifications of infants and their parents that had good predictive ability to code for secure and insecure outcomes. And then the split-second, mutual, intuitive, interactive regulation captured on mother-infant videos spoke strongly to me of bioenergetic analysis as an embodied relational encounter. Neuroscience data are more empirical and objective than the data supporting many therapeutic schools or approaches. I believe they offer many of us a sense of scientific affirmation for our work, similar to what I just shared about the attachment paradigm. I think this is particularly true for us in the area of body-oriented psychotherapies, since we have, we have all been marginalized by the mainstream talk therapies since Ferenczi and, and Wright parted ways with Freud. I remember some years back, for instance, feeling good about Alan Shore's delineation of a right brain to right brain infant caretaker dialogue, which lays down the neural circuitry of affect regulation. The child's attachment experience, Shore proposed, has been hardwired into his right limbic system as a model of relationships to come. As further testimony to the impact of such clinical theory building, Michel Dupri Godin has conducted an online book club and will offer a workshop at this conference on Shore's work, I think, later today. As I have said, this is a very individual matter with each of us. I had already felt affirmed by and drawn to the split-second nonverbal communications explicated in the studies of mother-infant interaction, 
So although I was intuitively drawn to Alan Shore's work and had been fascinated by neuroanatomy from the time that I was a medical student, the neuroscience data which supported Shore's model was actually not that important to me. I was already convinced. So what we find useful from neuroscience depends on how well our existing models are working for us and what kinds of transferences we form to the people who teach us the models, which in turn depends on partly how well these people embody the content that they're teaching us. For instance, if we never meet a person, uh, meet someone in person, it may be easier to have an idealized transference to them and their models. <laughs> I'm not mentioning any names. <laughs> Additionally, sharing knowledge about how the brain works may be helpful to some patients. Understanding something of the neural circuitry that underlies their behaviors may give the patient the necessary distance to reflect on such behaviors and thereby reduce the accompanying guilt and shame. Also, as Morgan mentioned, knowledge of the brain's neuroplasticity, that is the lifelong capacity of our brain cells and their connections to change, gives hope both to therapists and patients that it is never too late. Finally, uh, so this is just a complicating comment. When, you're, when I'm trying to decide how helpful some aspect of neuroscience can be for our healing, I cannot fully separate the neuroscience from the relational significance of it to the patient. For instance, tomorrow I expect that you will be learning about how Dr. Siegel has woven aspects of neuroscience into a rich clinical method of healing that he calls mindfulness. Among the many facets of his approach, I am struck as Dr. Siegel himself was, or said he was in his book, by the overlap between mindfulness and the processes of secure attachment. He says, quote, at the heart of this process, I believe is a form of internal tuning in to oneself that enables people to become their own best friend, end of quote. So as I understand this, people learn how to treat themselves well, that is, how to tune into themselves, from the way they are treated by Dr. Siegel. Dr. Siegel shows an exquisite sensitivity to his patient's subjective experience of his mind and body, of the mind and body of the patient. This strikes me, as I believe it did Dr. Siegel, as a later day version of the respectfully attuned parent whose awareness of his child's inner life codes for a secure outcome. How do we distinguish the healing effect of this relational dynamic from the neuroscientific parts of uh, his explanatory model, such as the middle prefrontal cortex, the insula, and the rest of what Dr. Siegel has named the resonance circuitry? His clinical vignettes, by the way, show an extremely creative and nuanced application of an understanding of the brain, mind, body to each of his patients' unique issues. Okay, uh, the fourth section. So, the fourth section. What neurobiology does not do for us? So the science as Margaret told us this morning, is fascinating. Marco Iacoboni's book, I don't know if I pronounced his name properly, uh, Mirroring People, describes the way uh, science really happens and the personalities and process involved. In this instance, surrounding the discovery in Parma, Italy, of these amazing neurons, the mirror neurons. And it is, a, it is really a, it reads like a kind of a, an adventure story. The world of therapy may never be the same now that we know that these neurons are at the base of our imitating, identifying with, and internalizing, and so on. 
and who is to say what discoveries are yet to come?